Welcome back Compounder. So today we talk about Coke. Coke has been probably one of the most iconic purchase by Warren Buffett and of course Berkshire Hathaway. And the first time he purchased the stock was in 1988. So this has been almost 35 years ago or more or less 35 years ago. This is actually another great example after last week when Guy has talked about American Express. This was also another purchase in the 60s that time by Warren. And so this is great because this is when compounding works at its best. And actually talking about Coke a few days ago, Monish Pabrai was in Nebraska giving a lecture at the University of Nebraska. I think he was following probably the Berkshire meeting. He was in the same area and he was also talking about Coke since of course it's probably something that everyone can learn something from by trying to go into the details and try to see why Warren has purchased the stock at that valuation at the time. So let's listen to Monish. In 1988, amazingly, Berkshire put a quarter of its book value into Coca-Cola, 25% company they didn't control. And from 88 to 98, they had a, just a spectacular, you know, 32% annualized return. And Coke in 98 was trading at a nosebleed valuation. It was trading like the Nifty 50 was. It was and, you know, in the meetings in 1999 and in 2000, Warren couldn't praise the company enough. You know, there was such a great company. And then if you look at it from 98 till today, it's been just 4% a year. It's been positive, but it's just 4%. And actually it went through a long period of time where it was just flat and actually declined quite a bit. And Warren mentioned that in hindsight, he should have sold Coke in maybe the 99, 2000, because it was really difficult to justify that valuation. And but even, even when you take the suboptimal decision of not selling Coke at this really high multiple, when we look at it over the entire period, we're still ahead of the index. You know, it's 12% versus 10.5%. And this is one of the things that is a, is a dilemma for me that I'm still trying to, trying to figure out is basically what happened with, you know, whether the Coke decision to keep it or not keep it, which way is it, is it better? So there's some key lessons uh, that I've been able to figure out. The first key lesson is the error rate is going to be huge. <laughs> so if we have Warren and Charlie having these big errors, you know, mere models like us, you know, we're just going to have a big error rate. The second is don't cut the flowers and don't water the weeds. So that was an amazing buy for Berkshire, of course. So 32% annualized from 1988 to 1998, especially when the position that Berkshire took was 25% of book value. So it was a huge position and it performed in an amazing way. One thing that we may want to understand is whether or not there was a single reason or a few reasons that convinced Warren Buffett to have this huge position in Coke. So we went back to an interview that Charlie Rose had with Warren many years ago, and Warren was saying something about exactly this. Let's listen to it. In 1988, you started buying Coca-Cola. How come? I, I don't remember exactly. I probably read their annual report. Uh, I probably read the 1987 annual report. I've, been, I've watched it some, but there just comes a point there's a tipping point, you know, in terms of knowledge you've accumulated over a period of time, price changes in the stock, which had gone down some. They were heavy repurchases of their own stock. Roberto and Don were doing a terrific job. Nothing bad was going to happen to Coca-Cola, so I started buying. Most of it in that period from the middle of 88 to early 89, but then about a little further on. But we put overall about a billion dollars into it, and it's probably worth about eight billion now. So Warren was saying that there are several reasons and essentially at some point he understood that it was a good opportunity. He mentions specifically that nothing bad would have happened to Coke. So there was this conviction that the brand and the history of Coke were a very wide moat for the investment and for Coke itself. And also he mentions that they were buying back a lot of shares during that time. Eventually, he bought about a billion dollars worth of stock in just a few months, 
And he mentions that the investment was worth eight billions at the time of the interview, which was 2006. We can go on Stratosphere and look at the financial statements of Koch back from 1985 and see how they looked like back then and what were the changes that occurred in the following decades. Yeah, and also here on Stratosphere, we can see, of course, the price chart from the beginning. So here, actually, we can go all the way back from 1962. And we can see that from the 80s, basically, is when the price started to, in a way, skyrocket. And I was actually reading these days the Warren Buffett way. This is actually a very nice book for those who are interested in learning more about how Warren sees the market and thinks about investing. And of course, there is a lot about Coca-Cola. And I remember that in the 80s, it was when the CEO Roberto Goizueta, that was a CEO from the 1980, he started to kind of change a little bit what was happening in the company. And his main idea was to basically increase the ROE and the margins. And we will see actually when Guy is going to walk us through all these different numbers that basically from 1985, 1986, all these metrics started to go up and then the company has performed the way we know. And if you're interested, of course, you can take the book and read it. I think it's a very, very nice book. But what you will see about Coca-Cola was that uh, the CEO in, in the 80s basically focused on the brand of Coke, deciding to focus on what Coke was best at. So basically selling the soda and really expanding in the US and in Europe, as it happened in the 80s, in the 90s and even after, without really spending time and money on other businesses that the previous CEOs had started and were not so profitable. One interesting fact is that Warren started to buy after the 87 crash. So if we look at the chart from the 80s to today, of course, the 87 crash seems to be a little blip. But if we reduce the time interval to an interval between, let's say, 85 and 89, then we can see that the crash was actually quite big and the stock remained at a relatively lower price compared to the all-time high of 1987 for quite a while, for at least one year and a half of two years. So we can see that the peak was achieved in August 87 and uh, in uh, 88 for many, many months, the stock price was 25 or 30 percent below that peak. So Warren was buying during that time and he was buying a lot of the volume of the stock. This is the first thing that, so he was buying something that went down 25, 30% and remained there for quite some time. The second thing that we can see is that the revenue of Cook were going up, but they were not super stable. It was still a little bit bumpy. So this is something just to remember that even if the revenue went up, of course, over a long period of time, it was not super smooth sailing. So we can see that, for example, in 87, they were below 86, and even in 88, they were below 86. Then, of course, it started growing again. But in 88, when Warren was buying, he was buying into a company that was performing a little bit worse than the previous years. So this is yet another factor to take into account, just to try to understand what was the environment back then. We can see, of course, that the margins started increasing. So in 85, the gross margin was 51%, and then it steadily increased. This, of course, is a huge tailwind for profits. So the strategy of the leadership team was really working in this case. This was not only just a matter of gross margins, we can see that also the operating income was increasing, also the net income was increasing, so everything was going in the right direction. One thing is that it doesn't seem to me that Coke was an extremely cheap stock at that time. So if we go to free cash flow, we can see that in 89, 90, the free cash flow was around six or seven hundred million dollars. If we only look at the free cash flow, then we would be inclined to think that the stock was not so cheap. For example, if we take $700 million as the owner's earnings to be capitalized, since at that time the federal funds rates were about 7 or 8 percent, let's capitalize them, let's say, at, at 7 percent. So we would get $700 million 
divided by 7%, we will get about $10 billion. And we knew that at that time, actually, the debt of the company was not very high. So we can just use that as an approximation of the fair value. So 10 billion. But at that time, the market cap was about 14 billion. So of course, there was some growth that was baked into the price. Not so much, but it was not a screaming cheap company. But we can also look at another metric that probably is the preferred metric for Warren Buffett, which is to count only the maintenance capex in the formula to get from operating cash flow to something that is similar to free cash flow. So we don't count the growth component of capex. If we do that, we can go on operating activities. And we see that in 89, for example, the net cash provided by operating activities was 1.1 billion and the depreciation and amortization, which is a proxy for maintenance capex, was about 183 million. So the operating cash flow minus this approximation for maintenance capex was about 1 billion. And the same in 90, right? In 1990. So it was 1.28 billion in cash from operating activities minus a quarter billion in depreciation and amortization. So if we use that as maintenance capex, of course, it's not always so simple, but as a first approximation, let's do that, we get a billion. So in that case, if we capitalize a billion at uh, the usual 7%, because back then the federal funds rate were higher, we get 14. And that is closer to the market cap of the company at that time. And of course, here, I'm not taking into account the, the net debt, but it was relatively small at that time. So we can try to think that it was not a screamingly cheap company, but the growth baked into the price was relatively small. And so probably Warren thought at that time that there was a relatively small downside for such a big brand. So the growth, the implied growth in the price was relatively small for such a big brand. And so he bought a lot. But another thing that Monish was pointing at and we also, we listen from Warren himself, is what happens then afterwards. So we know now that the stock price compounded at 30% CAGR for 10 years. But if we look at the valuation ratios, so we go to ratios, valuation, we see that most multiples were increasing. So for example, the price to earnings was about 15 in 85, 86, 87, 88. And then it started to grow and it was 22 in 1990, 32, 33 in 91, 92. And it was even higher at the peak of this frenzy or bubble in the late 90s. And this was not just the price to earnings, right? We know that the earnings are an accounting measure, so it's not the only thing that we should look at. But look at the price to sales. It went from 1.3, 1.6 in the mid 80s to 8, 7, 8 in the late 90s. The same for price to operating cash flow. It was 18 in 1989, and it became 48 in 1998. Most multiples were expanding. So this means that, of course, the company was doing exceptional things. The margins were expanding. And we could look at the return on total capital, the return on equity. Everything was growing a lot, but the price grew even faster. So at some point, it would have made sense to sell. So Monish points out that in the late 90s, it would have made sense to sell. Of course, in hindsight, everything is clear. But we can see here that if we lived through those years, we could have seen this multiple expansion. And this just means that part of the future returns were anticipated. And so overall, then the stock performed well, actually better than the S&P 500 from the late 80s to today. So why didn't Warren sell? And Charlie Rose was asking exactly this question. So we can hear from Warren Buffett himself. You have said, though, that in, during the bubble, it got overpriced. There were some Very things that you might have sold sure. and would have been wise to have sold them at that time. If I was running the partnership like I did back in the 60s, I definitely should have sold those stocks. I mean, it, they, it, it, stocks went crazy. And but you do not today look back and say, I should have sold Coca-Cola when the bubble was there because... Uh, it, it just, I, it wasn't me. I mean, I wouldn't, you know, I... I, I I knew it was selling at a very fancy price, and I even wrote about it in the same way with Gillette. But, but you know, I, I don't do that very often. 
I'm not saying I wouldn't ever do it. I mean, if we went into the wild of speculative sure. orgy in history, orgy in history, and some of these things went crazy, maybe I would sell some. But I, it's not my. It it goes against the grain. For one thing, bu wonderful businesses are not that common. And if you get a big position in a wonderful business, not a bad thing. <laughs> Exactly. So, of course, he was aware of the fact that the stock was overpriced at that time. And he mentions that in the earlier days, if he had the equivalent of that position during the days of his partnership, he would have sold. Then, of course, there's also an issue of liquidity of that position. So he bought the position for many, many, many months. And maybe in another video, I can make some computations to show how much volume they should have been buying in 88. And so the equivalent would be to exit that position. So when one has such a big position in a stock, of course, the liquidity of that position is lower than, for example, for us. We can buy and sell our entire position in one second. But it's not the same thing if you have billions and billions at that time, $8 billion in that position. Of course, he could have sold, but probably he didn't want to. And anyway, it worked out very well because as Monish points out, the investment has beaten the market in the last 35 years. Great, thanks. And I guess this concludes the video for today. As always, if you want to check out the description down below, you can see, for example, how to become a member of our Patreon community. Or if you are interested in using Stratosphere and using some of their paid plans, you can use our promo code in the description down below to get a discount. And then we are going to see you on Friday. Before that, if you like the video, please give us a like and consider subscribing to the channel and see you soon. Bye bye.